Good morning, Marianas. It is 6.24 a.m. on Wednesday, the 31st of August, 2022. I'm Troy Torres. And I'm Danielle Baza. Well, where has the year gone? We are uh, with September, <laughs> October, November, December. Christmas is coming up. Break out the Mariah Carey. When we come back <laughs> from this short commercial break, uh, this is our agenda for today. It's very exciting. Our very first in-studio guest for Good Morning Mariana is the chairman of the Republican Party of Guam, Juan Carlos Benitez, will be joining us for the second half of that. But prior to that, uh, when we come back from these uh, commercial messages from our sponsors, uh, we will bring you our top headlines, which include uh, a crackdown on illegal Chinese immigration to the island uh, issues within the Guam public school system and a forum that's going to be happening today between Levin Camacho and Doug Moylan when we come back from this break. A great humanitarian once said that the difference between a career politician and a leader is the politician cares about the number of years served and the leader just cares about serving. This defines Senator Chris Duenas. He is a seasoned statesman whose focus has always been on being a champion for the masses and a fighter for the truth. Re-elect Senator Chris Duenas, speaking up for you. I am Chris Duenas, and I approve this message. Edward Alvarez, Treasurer. Fisher was a Peace Corps volunteer and an educator in the jungles of Central Africa. He went from educating children in impoverished nations to serving our nation in the United States Navy. Tom's legal expertise took him from the military courtroom as a judge advocate general to the courts of Guam where he has spent three decades representing our Manumco and our less fortunate. Tom Fisher knows the law. He'll be a great lawmaker. Let's vote attorney Thomas Fisher for senator. I'm Tom Fisher and I approve this message. A multi-agency task force assembled by Governor Lulian Guerrero to stem the illegal immigration of Chinese nationals has been busy locating and arresting the migrants, all of whom have been traveling from the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands by boat. According to Guam Police Department spokeswoman Officer Berlin Civella, the task force also receives help from a federal agency, Homeland Security Investigations, and from the Office of the Attorney General of Guam. Task force officials have confirmed their suspicions the migrants are receiving on-island assistance once here, but have not released information as to why they are coming to Guam and whether they are seeking asylum. have been docking on north northwestern shores of the island for the past several months in boats purchased from Saipan residents mere days prior to the departure from Saipan, according to records from the Commonwealth government. The U.S. government years ago granted the CNMI parole authority to allow visitors from the People's Republic of China. That same authority does not apply to Guam. The Guam Department of Education has yet to respond to several questions candidates sent yesterday regarding unsafe conditions at F.B. Leon Guerrero Middle School. 
Students of the Jigo School have sent pictures and videos to Candid of what appear to be unsanitary and dangerous conditions at the old and rundown school. Puddles of a dirt colored fluid can be seen in one classroom, and according to students, more fluid rises to the surface as they step on the tiles. In another photo of the same classroom, closet doors are rotting. In another classroom, buckets litter the floor to catch multiple ceiling leaks. Multiple fiberglass ceiling tiles are either missing or soaked with light fixtures nearby. A video of another classroom shows water raining from the ceiling into a bucket. in other classrooms show a large rat in a trap, another rat in a classroom, and a dead rat in a crevice that according to students smelled so strong of decay and rat feces they had to be evacuated. Among candidates questions are whether repairs are being planned or if the school simply is beyond repair. We will follow up again today. Meanwhile we also have asked GDOE spokeswoman Michelle Frankes about reports from teachers throughout public schools that they have not been made whole with a promised 20% educator pay increase. According to several teachers, GDOE officials also have warned educators that they are unsure whether the educator pay increase will continue into fiscal year 2023, which begins October 1, 2022. Candid will be following up on the issue today. Finally, the drone industry is growing on Guam. Remember the Liberation Day drone show that mesmerized families throughout Tumon Bay? That was brought to you by Bella Wings Aviation. And today, the company celebrates the grand opening of its offices at the Tumon Sands Plaza. Candid will be on hand to cover the event, and we will also be recording this morning's forum between Levin Camacho and Doug Moylan, which is sponsored by the Guam Chamber of Commerce. At some point this afternoon, we will bring you full coverage of the event via live stream here. Uh, when we come back, uh, the chairman of the Republican Party of Guam, Juan Carlos Benitez, joins us live in studio. Uh, stick with us uh, through this commercial break, and when we come back, Juan Carlos will be with us. Bottom line is we're going to make you a better person, you're going to be healthier and fitter than you were before.
The Jones Act is a 1920 law justified on national security grounds as a means to bolster the U.S. maritime industry. It restricts domestic shipping to vessels that are U.S. built, U.S. owned, U.S. flagged, and U.S. crewed. However, this law boosts costs by banning foreigners from competing and forcing Americans to purchase ships that are up to eight times more expensive than those built in other countries. The result is higher transportation costs. Shipping oil from Texas to the Northeast, for example, costs three times more than importing oil from Africa. Ultimately, consumers foot the bill. In addition, higher shipping costs push freight from ships onto other sources of transportation, such as trucks, which means more traffic and pollution. Meanwhile, this blatant protectionism has failed to benefit builders of ships in the U.S., whose production is less than 1% of those in China and South Korea. Domestic builders have seen over 300 shipyards close since the early 1980s. Jones Act defenders claim the law ensures adequate U.S. ships during times of war, but during U.S. deployments during operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, foreign flagged commercial ships carried twice as much equipment as their U.S. counterparts. In fact, the U.S. was so desperate for shipping that it twice requested the use of a cargo ship from Moscow. Both requests were denied. So the Jones Act has failed to achieve its shipbuilding and national security goals while driving up costs for consumers. It's time for this outdated, costly, and ineffective law to be repealed. It's time to end the Jones Act. Gracious. Good morning and welcome back. Thank you so much for sticking with us. Uh, our very first in-studio guest uh, here on Good Morning Mariana is uh, our morning show, our morning newscast on Candid. The chairman of the Republican Party of Guam, Juan Carlos Benitez. Thank you so much, Juan Carlos, for joining us. Uh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, this uh, is exciting. It's a little bit of a wet half a day this morning, though. It, oh, is it raining outside? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Time. We got here at the crack of, uh, not even the crack of dawn. It's still dark outside, so the roads already look wet from the yes. morning dew. So it's raining? Yeah. Heavy. Uh, yeah, I, I like the rain, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm good with it. Hey, it's good for nature. It really is. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm uh, excited and looking forward. You know, the elections for us is really starting now. Okay. So. Well, let's, let's, let me just ask the very first question. Do people want change? Absolutely. Okay. So if people want change, can you explain what happened in the primary election? Because there was a chance for change, mm -hmm. but it, it, it didn't happen. Yes, uh, but I think people are, are, are um, they, they're not quite understand uh, the results of the primary election. Okay, uh, explain it to uh, us. Michael St. Nicholas had the best results against an incumbent in the history of Guam. You've never had a challenge against a sitting governor okay. uh, that has able to garner almost 40% of the internal Democratic uh, Party vote. Okay. And uh, that is symbolic because that, that's your base. You, you're supposed to be getting 80, 90 percent. You know, we got 99.1, right, mm -hmm. uh, uh, on our side. So it, it's surprising that he was able to it, – it's not surprising. It's indicative okay. that he was able to garner such a, such a high number uh, okay. coming up. That's even uh, – uh, when you look in and consider it, it's a sign of problems in the party. When you add to that the fact that you had probably one of the lowest turnouts on the general election that I have seen in, since I've been in Guam, uh, that, that was concerning to me, and I'm trying to figure out if, how I explain it internally. Uh, we saw a lot of excitement, at least on our side, of people honking and moving around. Uh, we were, the election commission was expecting 60% uh, turnout to, for this election. I was more thinking about 50%. Uh, but 40 was uh, unexpected. But um, if you spend over a million dollars of campaign funding, You're plus, talking about the Lou campaign. Yes, okay. plus what I consider over $2 million of federal and state funding in campaigns where the half of the ad is your face and, and, and your lieutenant governor's You're face. About the federally funded advertisements. Yes. Uh, you would have expected that there would have been substantially more people participating at the poll and that she was, would have been able to drive a larger percentage of that voting population. I know that the Democratic Party of Guam is not just 40 percent of the island. We know that traditionally it was perceived to be the largest number. Uh, so what do we see? Do we see a, a huge shift into the Republican Party? I hope so. Well, let's talk about that. What do you say to the 7,200 Michael Sinicholas voters 
myself included, uh, and uh, all those who perhaps would have voted for him in a general election just didn't come out for a primary election. What do you say to all of the MSN supporters uh, in order to get them to vote for Felix Camacho? I basically said, if you are completely uh, disappointed or let down of uh, what we had had as a government for the last four years, uh, I hope that you would take a chance and um, look at Felix Camacho's campaign, look at his podcast, uh, come maybe this Thursday, this Thursday we're having our Lincoln Day dinner, uh, come listen to what, what message we're bringing up and what we're doing. Uh, and you'll see a difference, and, and, I, and we, we welcome you and hope that you will come and stay with us. Uh, we stand for a small government. Uh, I think we, we also stand for education, safety, and, and a strong economy. So what we're going to be looking at and the issues we're going to be talking is about how do you rebuild and how do we bring back Guam to where it used to be. Um, Felix Camacho was governor through the worst uh, natural disaster that this island has ever happened. Two super typhoons and an earthquake. Um, he took an island that, that was similar to, to now, no tourism, no power. We didn't even have light. The, the fuel depots were burning and, uh, and brought it back not only to pre-existing standard to, but to better and improved standard. He built five, five public schools and he continued to improve the infrastructure of our land and an island and left the island a lot better than he took it in. I think it's a chance to go back to those days. So both campaigns, both the, let's let's I'm sorry, but both gubernatorial campaigns are have similar messages. One is, you know, come over those of you who did not vote for us in the primary or those of you who didn't vote in the primary at all come over you have a home with us mm -hmm. that's their first message and the second is you know our candidate our gods who mm -hmm. you know had to go through this tremendous difficulty during their tenure in office and so therefore you know you should vote for us because you know that kind of experience translates into good governance so what's the difference between Lulian Guerrero and Felix Camacho the fact that we didn't talk about things we were going to do and just keep the money in the bank account, the fact that we actually talked about what needed to be done and was done. Power was restored on the island. The fuel depots were fixed. The schools were improved. The infrastructure of our roads was quickly and put into place. The health care of our island was immediately taken into account. And I think that's where you're going to see a big change in the campaign as we move forward. It's, uh, it's going to be about action of what we're going to do and what we're going to achieve, not this uh, idyllic concept of, oh, well, generally I'm going to do something like this, but actually not implement the programs or actually do the work. So the, so what you're raising is a credibility issue, essentially, and, and it's the credibility of one candidate against the other. I, I have to play the devil's advocate sure. here. The Lulian Guerrero campaign did a very good job at, at some would say, some would argue, painting themselves uh, as that credible candidate, the, the candidate that was able to deliver, even though it was using federal funds that her opponent uh, was the one that marshaled in and brought in. Uh, but they had the uh, incumbency and the money and also the audacity, some would argue, to claim credit for things that they didn't do. They're going to... I mean, I, if I were a betting man, I'd say they're going to do the same thing in this election. How do you guys counter that? Well, I, I go by parts. One of the things is uh, Michael Sagnicolas uh, reached out to the Republican Party as we were going through the different years to address some of the major concerns that we have in Washington. Um, we, we wrote letters together. Uh, we got the Republican Party to support measures very quietly, not a lot of fanfare or, or issues going on. Uh, but it's interesting how the administration now is starting to take credit for a lot of the work that we did behind the scene. Um, I, I, would, I would say, and I've said this before in a number of these issues, you know, where are the letters? Where are the trips where the governor and, and this administration went to Washington, D.C., and it rode to the members of the Senate and the House supporting the changes that we we're going for? And, and I don't remember any of them. In fact, some of the time, that was the complaint I was getting from some of the Republican senators. They're saying, well, where's the governor on this? And I said, well, 
I can guarantee you the governor's not going to oppose this, but we were not expecting letters at, the, at that point because uh, if San Nicolas was moving an issue, uh, she didn't want to support it. Uh, so now it's intriguing when they said, oh, well, we discovered this issue uh, coming up. I'll tell you where in areas that I am concerned and where you would see a big difference. I think under a Republican administration, I think a state of emergency would end. I still don't understand why we'll have one going on right now. Uh, she keeps arguing about certain funding. I disagree with her interpretation of that, of federal law regarding those issues. Uh, but uh, outside of, of procurement, it doesn't make any sense that we have not reestablished our democracy. There should be balance between the different powers. Uh, I think we would look at a lower GRT, bring it back and bring in some form of safety or assistance to the private sector economy in this island. To continue to argue the economy is super strong and we have nothing to be concerned about, it, it's, it's foolish. Uh, when, when, when you come to consider, we used to get 1.6 million tourists a year. That was our strongest leg of our economy. And they're touting, well, there's been an increase in tourism. Yeah, we're now looking maybe, what, 200,000 tourists a year? And that doesn't make up for the 1.4 million tourists that we used to receive. A lot of the tourists that are coming are military tourists. The Department of Defense has been grateful and thankful in working with us uh, and making sure that they give live here to assist their hotels. But they don't spend the same. They don't pay the same. You know, they, there's reduced federal, federal rates for the hotels. So it's not like they're booming. Uh, one of my things that I, I was intrigued as I walked down on election day, I kept saying this Lula and Guerrero signs uh, on a cart with wheels parked in front of businesses that had gone, that had closed. And I'm saying, what sort of weird dynamic do you see here when you see that they're using the space that used to be the parking for a supermarket to just park their car and tell that the economy is strong? How can it be strong for that business? You know, you look at Kitchen Lingo. You look at Carmen's. You you look at a at a. I miss Carmen's a lot. Yeah, me too. I saw uh, Carmen at I'm a church. Mexican. Yeah. I saw Carmen at church, yeah. and I I, I I I hugged her, and I was like, "Are you going to reopen a restaurant?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm a Mexican at heart. I love Mexican food, and uh, it's sad to see that. And then you you go to Chuck E. Cheese. You you go to Sky Zone. Uh, you keep looking around the amount of business in this island that have permanently closed, not temporarily closed, and. You can't believe when they tell you, no, the economy is super strong, we're going to be doing great. Um, in D.C. right now, we're facing a Medicaid crisis. This cliff is, is not a slight cliff. It's a, it's a humongous problem we're facing. Tw uh, we have a cap of $29 million normally. Uh, Congressman said Nicholas, working with us, we were able to raise it to $129 million, And we were able to change the mass from 55% to 84 percent if i'm not wrong which, which again juan carlos this is this is my point the administration took credit for that and they were able to take credit for that because of the power of the incumbency and the amount of money they had in order to advertise the credit taking that they were doing how are you guys going to battle with that are you guys going to be raising the money are you going to be advertising are you going to have a message machine a ground game what's going on well we well we're never we don't own a bank okay <laughs> and we don't have and we don't have the marketing campaign of, of the state government in the way that it's been used now which i consider to be you know uh extremely unusual so you how know, are you guys going to compete with that um we're, we're gonna we're gonna be s s smart and nimble okay and, and we're gonna be everywhere you okay. know the 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 biggest thing for our side is we're united for the first time since i've been here you look at our senators, you look at, our, you, you look at our, our candidates running up, we're all going in a team, we're all going around together. Uh, we meet weekly with the gubernatorial team to see what they're doing and where they wanna go. Um, so you're gonna see a sea of voices coming out through this process, supporting what we're trying to do and agreeing to that. The other part is talking to actual business owners and, and decision makers in, in the island. We're meeting with the doctors, we're meeting with the wholesalers, we're meeting with the private sector, we're meeting with government employees and unions, just to hear what are their concerns or their needs. 
Uh, so that when even we with come, unions, even That's with unions, uh, yes, we, you would be surprised. A number of the unions have been very upset with the way that they have bypassed the traditional uh, government procure, uh, recruitment process into doing all these emergency uh, hires into the agencies Understood. Understood. Uh, with with completely different salary bases and structure than what the, they they have. So it's it's uh, it's been interesting to see, and it's a, a evolving uh, uh, development, but. Uh, since election day, uh, we've been pleasantly surprised about the uh, amount of people that have come over and reach out to the party, and we've reached out to a number of them uh, and try to say, look, uh, it's not easy losing. Uh, take, take a breath, but if you're committed to bringing change and to doing this a different way, uh, come talk to us. Come talk to us at the Republican Party. Have you spoken with Congressman Sinicholas since Saturday night? I have text with him. I have not had the opportunity to uh, personally talk to him. Okay. Um, and the the other thing that I commit to you is uh, we we will have a campaign on issues and substance. We're not going to have a campaign on slander and misrepresentation. I think attack politics like what they did to Congressman St. Nicholas and, and Bree uh, is on call for in this island. It, it, it doesn't go with the nature of the people of Guam. Uh, well, actually, that's one of my questions, and maybe we will expound on that a little bit more. Uh, a couple of dynamics uh, to raise to your attention. One is uh, that both the statements from the Mike and Bree campaign and from the Selena Nelson campaign said nothing about supporting their Democratic uh, rival who prevailed. Uh, and so do you see that as opportunity? And second, the second part of this is... Uh, the number of people who voted in the congressional race for Dem for the Democratic congressional race is below the number of people who voted in the gubernatorial race, meaning a bunch of people who voted in the Democratic primary uh, didn't vote, didn't choose a, uh, a congressional candidate there. Your thoughts? I, I think uh, you were not allowed to cross uh, party ballots in this process, and I think a lot of those uh, no votes were uh, actually votes for uh, Jimmy Moylan, okay. uh, for Cong uh, Senator Jimmy well, future congressman. Jimmy what, what, what about this uh, notion that uh, neither candidate who uh, uh, lost the, co the gubernatorial and congressional race on the Democrat side said in their statements, I want all my supporters to vote for the team or the candidate that prevailed um it's it's not unusual or not a, un, unexpected uh, you know we're, we're not going we were not expecting that we we're going to get a, a full endorsement from any candidate right now i think I, it's uh, uh you need to let, let people have a time to make the decision what they want to do there the being an elected official is not easy uh, it's a hard job uh people assume that you're earning a million and a half uh when you're not and and you have to uh, suffer a lot of issues, like attacks against your family. I've never seen the attacks, personal attacks that happened in this election uh, before with the tenacity and, and longevity. Uh, well, let's, let's talk about this. This is the second time you're bringing it up. The, yeah. the tenor of the commentary, the tenor of the conversation. Uh, you have uh, high up officials like Jane Flores who have made highly inflammatory remarks against uh, Congressman Michael St. Nicholas. And you have others throughout the uh, Leon Guerrero administration who have made very personal attacks against not just the congressman, but also against Sabrina Salas Matsunani. Uh, it, let's start with, are you guys ready for those sort of attacks against you? We're expecting they're coming. Okay. And uh, we've been in politics long enough. Uh, that we are sort of hard skinned. We know it's going to happen and we're going to continue to move about it. We're not going to allow them to distract us from the reality, which is showing where we are and where three and a half years of the Lula and Guerrero administration has brought us. Give us some inside baseball here. What were you guys saying to each other, you know, in conversations that you would have with the uh, Governor Joe Atta or Phil Flores or Shelley Gibson, what kind of conversations were you have were you having as you were seeing the mud slinging on the Democratic side? We we just couldn't believe it. We okay. were going. This is a, a party. You know. You know what for me was amazing is if Congressman San Nicolo would have won, I think we all expected that the entire leadership of the Democratic Party would have resigned. 
uh, <laughs> because they all came on record not only about opposing him, but re made repeated comments uh, uh, that were derogatory towards him and, and his running mate. And uh, I've never seen that. In fact, under the Republican Party bylaws, we need to be neutral through this entire process. You're not supposed to pick a candidate and support it and, and push it the way that, that they did unless the entire central committee of the party has met. That's all the village org leaders. That's all the elected officials and gotten together. And a super majority of them agreed to uh, endorse one candidate in the primary process. Almost never seen in the United States. But, boy, the, 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 this party had a favorite. And... Uh, it didn't stand just at the governor. It went down to the senatorial slate and the congressional slate. And um, why why would you interfere? You, you're asking me, how, how are you expecting those voters and their supporters to be excited about coming back and joining you when you have made all this uh, horrible comments and thoughts about that individual before? So are you guys cranking out the phone calls to supporters of both Talina Nelson and Mike Nicholas? Absolutely. Yeah, I, but I, I'm, I'm guessing you guys see that, you know, it might be a little easy, that, that the prevailing candidates might have made it a bit easier for the Republicans to start taking their supporters. Yeah. Well, well again, when you see that only 20 percent of the electorate, right, when you when you when you look at that, voted for the incumbent uh, on a primary, uh, when when you look that almost 40 percent of the entire Democratic Party did not vote for the incumbent. You see that there's a problem. Uh, we see it as we can see her ceiling. We know uh, her machine, what he can do. Uh, now, what can you do? What can they do? They're going to throw more money at it. Uh, on our side, we need to be nimble and we need to be quick. We're going to raise money like you've never seen, but we're not going to beat her. She, last time she lent herself You're not 800 beat her in the election in, in, in finance okay in financing last time she raised eight she lent herself eight hundred thousand dollars you know I'm expecting she's going to lend lend herself over a million dollars in this next cycle uh, based on this primary results because uh, they're concerning f in, for their internal uh, machine uh, on our side uh, we're focusing on our village work we're going to harden those we're going to give them any support that they wanted we saw where which villages need a little more help and we will do that, and we're going to go on a, cant on a substance campaign, and it's going to start this Thursday. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about uh, that ground game that you're talking about. The Lou and Josh campaign have a superior advantage in their leadership of Rose Ramsey over the ground game. Rose Ramsey was the woman who, I mean, she organized the Calvo machinery. And when she went over to the Lou and Josh campaign, she took part of that machinery over. Do you have the remaining part of the Calvo machinery now working for Republican candidates? Uh, and is that growing? Yeah, I would say uh, Governor Calvo and, and, and his machine is all with us. Okay. Uh, you do have some, in, some individuals that participate in the process that, has work, that work with Rose. Uh, Rose Ramsey also run the, run the BOTA campaign, uh, which when I, I was shocked. Which was supposed to win. Yes. It was supposed to win until Ray Tenorio took out that gun during the uh, block party. Right. But, but all, the, all indications were that he was supposed to have been the governor. And yes, Rose Ramsey was in charge of his ground game. Rose Ramsey was in charge of his ground game. The uh, governor Lula Guerrero's campaign beat her machine, beat Rose Ramsey's machine. I'm, I'm intrigued how those individuals felt when all of a sudden they were told, hey, Ron Francis is going to run the re-election. It's uh, the person that you beat and her machine is going to run the re-election. Because uh, it, it sort of says, like, you don't believe in me and uh, the, fi or the work that I did to get you here. Uh, so structurally, that's not something I would have done. Um, uh, Rose is a very good organized driver and, and, and machine worker, but she also splintered the party. In a, in, we had to do damage control and a lot of the problems because she did not use the party uh, machinery uh, to move forward. She created her own team and her own machine, uh, cre and it created a lot of div div divisiveness in inside the party, which, which took years to heal. But it worked in 2010 and 2014. Arguably, Rose Ramsey delivered a Calvo victory. Yes. Yeah. But you're saying in 2018, 
it was a different story. And yes. you're, you're hoping that in 2022, yeah. it so, also... So our model is one team. We have one village org that works for both the candidate and the party. And, and uh, we're voting straight across the, the aisle, 15 senatorial candidates, one congressional candidate, and one governor. We're, we are... Uh, uniting everybody under one structure. This concept of dividing and splitting the party uh, it, it did not work long term for the party. It was harmful, and we're not going to repeat that again. And if the Democratic Party wants to go there; they can. And and I think that that's the model they're following. It's if you looked at the campaign so far, it's been divisive. It's been splintering, and uh, um, we we don't support that. And that's not where we're going. So your village organization. Uh is it growing? Where are you guys strong? Where are you guys shoring things up? Yeah. Uh, well, some things we need to keep. You okay, know, to got ourselves. it. Understood. But, I but, tried. <laughs> but we're, but we're, um, we, we are evolving and taking lessons. We saw this as a dry run, and that's how we ran this primary election. We, we ran it. We know the numbers we need to hit. We were trying to get between 10 to 15 percent of the electorate to show up and participate. Uh, you got that. We got that. Okay. Uh, but uh, would we have liked to have seen more voters show up? Absolutely. You know, when when you really look at the numbers, what's really scary here is 40 percent didn't show up on Election Day. It was 25 percent of those voters, 5,600 that participated in the early voting process. Yes. So on Election Day, uh, you 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 had even less voters taking place of our election process. And, and that's that's so about 17,000. Just 17,000 out of 50, yeah. 58,000 registered voters in Guam. Um, that we need to, that I think our biggest challenge is to make sure we get people looking forward to coming and participating. Uh, we feel maybe it was a low turnout because uh, that poll came out right before the election to try to dissuade some of the St. Nicholas voters from participating. So uh, basically saying, uh, Lula and already won. Why even go to the polls? Um, but I think uh, a lot of people stayed home because they said we, we're going to come out in the general election. And that's that's when we're going to show where we stand. I want to play devil's advocate on an issue that is near and dear to the governor's heart, sure. uh, Governor Leon Guerrero, and that is her management of the pandemic. The Republicans right. generally have been critical of her management of the pandemic. Uh, most of the criticism has been that she went too far in many different areas or that she, there's no accountability, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but in terms of in terms of protecting the public health, mm -hmm. are you open to the possibility, hindsight being 2020 and the book not being written yet on how the pandemic response was in protecting the public health, sure. are you open to the possibility that the governor got it right? Uh, why or why not? Okay, so I, I would go by, by parts. Um, there were a number of decisions that were made. Uh, some of them make sense, some did not make sense. Okay. Uh, and you got to look at where we are. Uh, our biggest criticism was the shutdown of our economy and the cherry picking of businesses that could be open and could not be open and the way that the procurement process was done, emergency procurement process to benefit in particular individuals. That for me are my concerns when I look at her way of doing it. Uh, I have to look and compare ourselves to other jurisdictions and what they did. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at the Northern Mariana Islands and the fact that they didn't shut down the businesses, they, they work with the businesses, they put requirements, say, hey, if you, you're going to go, keep your distance. If you're going to participate, you know, you can wear a mask while, while you're doing different There was things. no mask mandate, which yes. I found incredible. But yeah. everyone wore their masks anyway. Yes. Yeah. Because the people here, we go through many disasters, and, and we know who address our concerns. Meanwhile, here in Guam, we had a continued rotating and changing issue of who could open, who could not open, uh, what requirements were you uh, allowed to have or not have, and what issues you needed to look. You know, uh, They were saying you need to follow the car score, depending where it's going, you're going to be able to open. Hotels come in, they start staffing. Okay, it looks like the numbers are going well. Oh, we're not going to follow that. We're going to go in a completely different direction. If you're a bar, we're not going to open the bars because we feel bars are too social in nature uh, without looking at whether the, what measures had that particular business taken to address those concerns. Uh, but more importantly, you can argue that all these uh, draconian measures that you took 
like roadblocks, like uh, forcing their mask mandates and, and closing the business um, was done to protect us and we should see the results compare uh, that we got. To, but she keeps going to the results of a document that was presented by her old folks of worst case scenario. In reality, I want to compare us to the Northern Marian Islands. Same population, you know, same build, you know, same uh, comorbidities. Same health issues. Uh, yeah. I want to compare us with the so southern part of the United States, which again have similar diets. Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Florida. And you end up looking at those and I'll just go with the Northern Marian Islands. Uh, you would expect they would have had one third of the amount of deaths that we had. They didn't. They had less. Uh, substantially less. Uh, you would have uh, looked at the number of cases to have been like substantially more than the cases that we had here. They did not. They, so did the measures keep us alive and protected us? You know, some of them, yes, but a lot of them made no difference outside of bankrupting and closing our businesses. What concerns you about another four years of Leon Guerrero Tenorio? Um, this next four years are going to be critical for the future of Guam. The federal government is going through an economic crisis. We spend like uh, we there was no tomorrow in addressing this pandemic, in working with uh, uh, local governments to right to reignite the economies in those states. Uh, those funding days are gone. This next four years are going to be what, years where the federal government is going to try to figure out how to recapture some of their funding and get the economy back, uh, uh, the inflation back on track in the United States. Uh, we need a governor that can work with the federal government and can address those issues. Lulon Guerrero uh, barely has touched D.C., uh, I have not seen any particular uh, impact on any regulation. I, if, thank God St. Nicholas was through this process working day in, day out, and willing to work with the Republican Party of Guam to make sure that s some of our mayor's concern as Medicaid Cliff got addressed. Uh, and I think it's funny, uh, 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 the governor is so adamant about not giving any credit to St. Nicholas, that she keeps giving credit to Kalili. It's almost like Kalili is now the, the congressman for Guam. And Kalili is the congressman of the Northern Mariana Islands, and, 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 and he represents them uh, over there. He does a good job, but it, it's, uh, it's uh, illusory to, to try to say in Washington, D.C., that you could pass any piece of legislation of this caliber and magnitude without the support of the congressman of your district. What concerns you about uh, the prospect of uh, Judy Wanpat becoming the congresswoman? Um, her position with the Department of Defense, uh, and, and uh, you know, people can uh, say what they want now, but reality is uh, we have a record. Uh, you end up having a record of where you've been and how you've treated the federal government and mm -hmm. argue with them. Uh, we should have learned through the few past decades that... Uh, going to Washington and shouting and calling them racist, bigots, or uh, discriminate, it doesn't work. What you need to do in your job is to show the disparity and the impact and the effect on local businesses. This is a criticism I had with the, with the governor. The whole Restaurant Relief Act was provided across the entire United States. And the restaurants in the territories got around 15% of the funding. The Every other state, 45 to 55%. How is that not targeting the funding for the relief tax? But did you see any statement from the governor complaining? You know, any issue. The congressman tried. We tried on our own. But but it, it we can't do it unless we have a united front. And we need a united front for the next four years. I think we're going to get that with Governor Felix Camacho in a Republican legislation and Jimmy Moyland in Congress. Uh, well, let's let's play pretend here. Let's pretend that uh, there is a Republican majority in the next legislature and Felix Camacho is the next governor of Guam. What are the top three changes the Republican Party would like them to make uh, when they get into office? Well, I would 
I would start by saying in in DC or or here? no no here on Guam and, and let's just throw out some ideas here uh, bond financing to fix all the schools um, a rollback of the BPT uh, I, I mean I'm just sort of throwing all this stuff out here yeah. well, a uh, furlough of uh, of government workers so that uh, we can balance the budget I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm spitballing here yeah. you know whatever so, so I would say first of all uh, find and provide the funding to fix the neonatal and 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 the uh, the maternity ward at maternity GMH. ward okay. at GMH. okay uh, two uh, I think it shouldn't it shouldn't take any time in uh, demolishing and rebuilding the Agania pool it, it it's I see it every day Our, as as a top priority one of the top no, three it's changes. one of the things that he would do oh, as okay. soon as he but came let, in. Let, let's talk about top three changes top three changes yeah I, w I would like to see uh, repeal of the GRT okay so bring it back to four percent okay um, I th I think uh, Sorry, which one was the first one I gave you? So you gave me maternity ward. ward. Yeah, maternity ward, repeal of the of, of the of the GRT, repeal of the uh, emergency uh, mandates, um, and okay. and then uh, I think I think at 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 the very least those those would be my first three to start with. Well, anything uh, about anything dealing with crime? Oh yes. Okay. I, I think uh, I think meet with the police department and police officers to talk to them about how do we redo recruitment and how do we get people in now uh you know the gap measure of getting retired police officers is a great move uh it should have been done three years ago when you started noticing that there was a there, there was starting to be uh you couldn't recruit the 40 police officers that were supposed to be recruited every year uh and the number of police officers started retiring through the process uh, but right now we're in emergency. That's a great s a gap measure. Now we need to move forward and figure a way how we retool this and make sure that we make we give them the respect that they need. Create a holistic system between the police officers, the attorney general's office, and prosecutors, uh, so that and and the Department of Corrections, so that this revolving door that we're seeing here where the police officers are disheartened when they arrest an individual they just for to have that person a, a few months later be left out on parole and then do a do a um, do a plea deal with the government it, it, we have to stop that because all it's creating is a continuing increasing crime system it it, it disheartens the police officers and emboldens the the criminals because they feel there's no real threat of for me to stay in prison at this age i just you know, a couple of weeks and then i'll be back out um that that's a major issue crime and security in this island uh education for our children we can no longer continue to look at a, providing the minimum standards of education we under this administration we have to waive the minimum number of days that kids need to be in school before they could graduate to the next class pass over to the next class we 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 need to stop being just doing our minimum we need to figure out how we we do our best and how we get our children are it's going to be the future of guam is going to be what those children do and what they achieve and we need to empower them and assist them to get there and uh governor felix camacho built five public schools when he was governor last time and i'm sure that we're going to be looking at what do we need to do now is it the infrastructure is it the is it the teachers uh, we we had a wonderful system with the federal government before where we were one education system that broke down uh, because our standards went so low, uh, maybe try to figure a way that we can try to give, start recapturing that and give it an option uh, to uh, Department of, of uh, Defense employees that come now to our island to uh, opt out, into, opt in into our public school system and participate, and we get those revenues, right? Uh, so that gives you education, that gives you the economy, that gives you public safety. Um, now, in the economy, we need to stop looking just short term and looking at what we need to do mid and long term. I expect that a governor, Felix Camacho, uh, would go to, go to the go and with the federal government, and Department of Transportation, and look at saying, how can we diversify our number one economic driver here, which is tourism? And for us, the, one of our big issues is 
getting the Guam CNMI visa waiver to be extended to the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, uh, and India. We need to find new sources of tourists to come to our island and participate and partake of, uh, of the beauty that we have to offer. Uh, we know the Japanese economy, uh, the tourist base is very hesitant as they restart. They'll come back and we're going to be looking forward to seeing them. But, but they're, they're, it's going to take years to get us back to the numbers we want. So any temporary is going to nonstop to Guam and they don't allow a single uh, passenger, passenger to, to, to come down. Well, that's where we need to try to figure out where we work. Uh, partial Jones Act exception, where we are, we're able to, uh, and I would say just at the very be beginning, with the inflation numbers coming up, the ability of local companies to buy U.S. goods versus competing foreign goods, it's, it's going to be it's going to be extremely hard to move forward with uh, unless we're able to figure a way to lower the cost. If, if they provide a partial exception of the Jones Act and allow Matson and APL both to maybe have one ship that qualifies under that exception, then we can lower the cost of goods coming into one. Um, what do you say? What do you say to people who are critical of uh, Governor Camacho's record on the payment of tax refunds uh, versus the Leon Guerrero claim that she is the governor who paid tax refunds on time. I know you, you might want to bifurcate that. <laughs> so, but, but, but go ahead. You go. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say everybody wants to pay tax refunds. Through Everybody wants to do that. Uh, you need to live with the reality of the finances that you inherited from your prior administration. Okay. And when Governor Felix Camacho came in, he inherited a big dark hole. Uh, credibility with the federal government was non-existent. FEMA refused to even provide us assistance for our schools because we, we uh, former Governor uh, Gutierrez. Gar Gutierrez, had stated, had, a, had signed an agreement to do self-insurance up to $20 million before the federal assistance would come in. And there was not a single record showing that we had spent any money or had created the, the bank of the $20 million. Uh, Felix Camacho was able to move through that, rebuild the infrastructure and the economy so that then under a Calvo administration, we started really br bringing up and repaying. We all had to do our due. Uh, he did provide a substantial interest rate to try to assist. We realized it was a problem. and uh, but. We need to live with what we have. Lou, Governor Lula Guerrero has been a recipient of a great economy in the. You're talking in, about the, an inherited financial situation from, from, the from Governor administration. Cabo okay. administration, and and she's continued to do what Governor Cabo was doing. Uh, but are you, guys, are you guys going to call out the claim that she's made? She said that she is the governor who paid tax refunds on time, but that's not true. And I don't hear the Republicans saying, Governor Leon Guerrero. That's not true. Governor Calvo did that. And I would yes. expect the Republican Party to be the first to come out and, and you know, claim it for their boy. Yes. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, but I'm not hearing it. Yes. I, I think you will. Okay. I think you will. I think uh, for us, again, as I stated before, our funding is not at the same level as a bank owner. And uh, so we have to save our funding for the general election. So now that the primary is over, I think now you're going to start seeing uh, – uh, the Republican Party and the Republican administration starting to uh, act actively uh, be in the media and showing and, and giving her message. But anybody who doesn't, I think everybody in Guam knows that it was Governor Calvo who was the first one to start providing payments on times. Uh, and, and with the assistant of Jay Rojas, I remember Jay doing the math and trying to figure a way around it and getting those bonds issued so that, that the taxpayers of Guam got their funding. No, it was Henry. It was Henry Titano. Uh, Henry working with Barclays. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I, as a matter of fact, I think uh, Pete's girl was a part of that conversation as well very early. Yeah. I remember this is back in 2011. Well, it's been quite well, a while. Well, you know more of the details that I did. It's been quite yeah. well. Uh, and that, <laughs> thank you for that segue. Thank you for that segue. I want to talk about cronyism and public corruption. We see that there was even an audit by the public auditor about what's things that have happened in the Leon Guerrero administration that are questionable. But cronyism and public corruption, and I know this firsthand, is not, is, is not just within the ambit of the Democratic Party. You know, it has also happened in a Republican administration, mm -hmm. at least, right? 
What assurances do people have that the candidates running for public office under the Republican Party now not only will be clean of cronyism and public corruption, but will advocate actively against it? Well, I, I'll, I'll go by, by, by parts. Uh, I wish I could say that uh, corruption had a party affiliation. Uh, it it happens. It's in both parties. It happens. Yeah. Even for individuals that are not in either parties, yeah. it, it, it's it's a it's a reality that we need to live with. What we need to do is strengthen the systems to prevent and, and bring expose those to light. Um, uh, I think uh, Attorney Tom, Tom Fisher is sort of looking uh, one of his big uh, initiatives in his campaign is to make sure that it, when, once he becomes a senator that they're going to push to try to create a commission and start looking into what's going on. He did very well in the primary. Yes, His performance in the primary, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I think it's, that's needed. I think you see it also from uh, Governor Felix Camacho. Uh, through his administration, you know. There, there were no scandals. And we no used, scandals. and during that administration, there was a substantial amount of federal funds coming into the island that had to be distributed and used to development of our people in rebuilding the island. As a matter of fact, the audits, including the federal single audit that happened every year during the Camacho administration, went from several qualifications, several findings uh, in the beginning down to zero qualification. Oh, I'm sorry, there was always the GMH and the revenue tax qualification because of privacy issues. Mm -hmm. There were those, but zero findings. The audits said, that's something, is that something you guys are going to talk about? Absolutely. The cleaning up of the books under the Camacho administration? Yes, because it needs to happen. If, if we continue to erode uh, the way that some of our leaders believe that uh, the public funds are their funds and that they can use it any way they want and to benefit of their, of their particular supporters, it's a detriment to our island. And uh, I, I, um, I've had the pleasure of... of um, of uh, knowing John Thomas Brown for many, many years and consider him a good friend. And uh, one of the last wishes that Ken Jones gave uh, John Thomas Brown was, I, I want you to start uh, cleaning up the procurement system of Guam in whichever way you can. And, uh, and Ken Jones companies provided the payment and continue to this day to do so, to try to help do this work. It, it's... Uh, so we need more John Thomas Browns. We need to listen to him and to other folks like him. And what do we need to do to bring transparency into our system here? Uh, we need to have limits. You know, you can't have an ad that half of the ad is a photograph or an endorsement of the administration's uh, candidates just saying, hey, we gave you this. It, you, there's no problem in, in informing that they're there, but the main purpose of that ad is to promote the program and tell people what the program stands for. I have an interesting question from one of our viewers before sure. I get to my last question, which is an interesting one. But this is also an interesting <laughs> one. Uh, Stephen Hattori, Attorney Stephen Hattori, yes. asked whether Governor Camacho would recognize the presidency of Joe Biden. Yes. Uh, he, we all have. This, this is a, an, an interesting, uh, this is a Robert Underwood uh, national issue with Trump, right? And... Uh, and the first thing I would like to tell everybody is that Donald Trump is no longer the president of the United States. If you didn't know that, you know, I, I think you should be aware that uh, uh, President Biden is the president of the United States. There's a question about the use of a term duly elected. And, uh, and it's, it's uh, the, uh, the way that in the, it depends what duly elected is or is not. And as uh, quoting uh, Bill Clinton in that regard, uh, the electoral colleges are uh, in the United States. Their system is not actual voters. Is the voters vote for representatives at electoral college? Those mm -hmm. electoral college representatives then come into in, into Washington and they and they uh, vote on certifying or not the election. Uh, the electorates and and certify. Sorry, that's if the kids are late for school. Uh, <laughs> The uh, that uh, those electors certified the election for uh, President Biden. No one's questioning that. We all recognize that he's the president of the United States. Uh, but if you're trying to imply it when you say 
duly elected that we feel that there was no irregularities in the general election, you know, that's where the discrepancy comes. It's people, and, and I live in a democracy. Everybody's allowed their own opinion. I, I've never been in, a, in, in, in feeling in Guam in a way that if you don't say what I want you to say, then, then, uh, then, then uh, you need to be chastised. That's, that's not the way. Look, President Trump got 12 million more votes than he did when he ran the first time. President Biden got 14 million more votes. Do you think that people are concerned about saying, wow, that's a lot of votes that showed up that were not, not there before? I'm concerned about it and I've looked into it. That's their own thing. They, were there irregularities in the election? I can guarantee you they were there are irregularities in all elections. Frankly, I don't care who the president yeah, of the United States but, is. <laughs> but but here, here's the one thing that for me is the funniest. It's Underwood who's bringing this issue over and over again. And Underwood to this day continues to argue that he won his election. <laughs> he continues to say, you know, have you heard it, right? That I was leading in the polls and then the machine that we had a power outage. And when the power outage came back, then I was losing in the polls. You know, <laughs> what happened there? I don't really, I think there was something. So how can he question the irregularities and then get upset that there's some people that are feeling, you know, we feel that there were irregularities in our election. Long-winded way. No one questions Biden as the president of the United States. Second answer, you're absolutely right. Who cares about this? What difference does it make? It doesn't impact our island at all in any way, form, or manner. I, I just don't want any – I don't care who the president is. I just hope none of our presidents uh, walk up to the Temple of Jerusalem and, and <laughs> urinate. That, that's, <laughs> that's, the, that's the only thing that concerns me about the presidency of the United States, at yeah. least in my lifetime. Uh, my final question is, uh, is a little interesting, and it's because it has to do – with the Democrat. No, sure. Actually, it's going to be a two-part question. Then the first part is, what do you think, what does the Republican Party of Guam think about Speaker Therese Terlahi? I, I thought she was going to run for Attorney General. <laughs> well, beyond that. I think she, she's a wonderful person. She's an independent thinker. I don't think she really belongs to each either party. She's okay. an attorney. Uh, and the... Uh, she made a decision to stay in the legislature. Uh, I, I think that she's had a confrontational experience with her party throughout all her, all her stint in the legislature. Um, but at least she thinks and argues. I don't mind people having different opinions. In fact, I love the fact that people are engaged in politics because uh, you need to care about what's happening in our island. And I don't mind that you disagree with me on your position. Some of my best friends are staunch Democrats. Uh, but but what I do mind is when when you don't really have a logical reason for your position or your argument. Yeah, I I believe in medical marijuana. It should be accepted. If we can put poison in our veins, we can definitely put to as a medicine. Of course, we can do uh, plant and plant extract. I don't like recreational marijuana. It's my personal opinion and concern. I believe life starts at conception. My personal point of view. I'm a very strong Catholic, uh, and the. Uh, if, if you're looking at those things, stands and there's a logic where my position comes from. That's why I expect from the other people. Terlis Terlahi has a logical for her position. She's very much uh, knows why she stands for an issue, where she passes it, and, and it's, uh, I, I can't predict where she's going to be an issue. I, I have no problems with her at all. She's been a good legislature. So the second part of my question is, if the Republicans take the legislature, do you think there's room for Terlis Terlahi uh, to be somehow contributing in a more substantial way than as a, simply a minority member? Well, well the, you know, first of all, is uh, my, my only concern with Teresa, she's not a Republican. <laughs> and, uh, uh, say, say, but, but she said she's an independent thinker. She is an independent and thinker. She, and that she doesn't necessarily belong to either party. Right. So, so uh, Couldn't you guys benefit from... Well, you know what's interesting is, uh, is Congressman Khalili runs as an independent yes and then he caucuses with the democratic yes. party in congress in the united states uh i i would completely be open of uh dirty Lahi being an independent voice if she wants to caucus with the republican party it would be great we would love to have her over that would be a very interesting dynamic yes and i'm uh, glad you're open to that yes and and you know and, and the same with chris barnett chris barnett and i disagree on the marijuana issue we we agree on a whole bunch of other stuff we have some issues we disagree with great guy uh, wonderful human being, but at the end of the day, uh, 
it, it's I think the, that he, that he'll be a, a good senator when he comes when he comes in. Uh, but I would advocate we need a Republican majority. We need a change. We need a legislation that will stand for the for a democracy and balance of and of powers. Uh, we've had this last this entire uh, legislature under emergency powers. They not, they didn't have any time in which they actually were able to provide the oversight that is required uh, in our in our democracy and, and in our system. And it's about time we end that. And we need a legislation that will stand for whoever is in Adeloup. Uh, I know Felix Camacho will be there, you know, and sometimes he will be upset with the Republican legislation. But at the end of the day, we we need to make sure that we have a strong representation there. So, what are the Republicans going to take this election? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. So, Thank you so much, Juan Carlos, for joining me here in our studios on the seventh floor of the DNA Building in Hagutnia, Guam. This has been a pleasure having you as our first guest in studio for Good Morning Marianas. It was really my pleasure and a great honor. Thank yeah, you. Come back anytime. Huh? We just uh, every time that you come, yeah, that you do come back. Let me know a couple of days ahead of time so I can make a call to the Democrats so that at least I offer them equal time. <laughs> yeah, we, we'll do. And, and again, I'll remind people, we're having our Lincoln Day dinner this Thursday. Uh, look to see everybody. We're, I think we're about sold out. So uh, anybody that wants to come, please uh, call the number of the Republican Party. It's on our signs and, and, uh, and our Facebook page. And uh, uh, get, get a ticket. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. For Candid News, I'm Troy Torres. Good morning. Tom Fisher was a Peace Corps volunteer and an educator in the jungles of Central Africa. He went from educating children in impoverished nations to serving our nation in the United States Navy. Tom's legal expertise took him from the military courtroom as a judge advocate general to the courts of Guam where he has spent three decades representing our Manumco and our less fortunate. Tom Fisher knows the law. He'll be a great lawmaker. Let's vote attorney Thomas Fisher for senator. I'm Tom Fisher and I approve this message. I'm Will Parkinson, and I'm standing in the bush. I'm standing in the bush because I want to be your senator. Before I ran for senator, I was actually involved in the legalization of this bush. I was one of the original advocates that supported Senator Clint Rogel when he legalized this bush. And if you elect me senator, I promise I will make sure no one ever makes this bush illegal ever again. So please, vote for me, Will Parkinson, number eight on the ballot. Thank you. And I'm Will Parkinson, and I endorse this message.